What's up? Welcome to my Child's Play review series. I am a horror YouTuber, which means I am feeling the pressure of October. It is steamrolling towards me is what it feels like. Because guess what, guys? In October, we have Halloween ends in theaters. We have the new Hellraiser series over on HBO Max. And we're going to have season two of the Chucky TV series. I'm going to be trying to cover all of this, which means I got to get crack a in ASAP. I got to get it right here, right now. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to review all of the Chucky movies over the coming weeks. We're also going to dabble in some Halloween. It's going to be a grand old time. This is why we do this. This is why this channel exists. So please go ahead and hit subscribe if you have not already and join me on this fun ride towards the Halloween month. But now, Child's Play, the first entry in this beloved franchise. How do I feel about it? What is my brief overview? It's a classic. That is right. I'm currently trying to organize my top 100 horror movies of all time. And without a doubt, this movie has a place on that list. I've always loved this movie. I think it's actually pretty important to me becoming a horror fan. I think this is a great film to show your kids. This is a nice introductory horror film. I know some people, you can't show a kid a horror movie, <coughs> Jamie Lee Curtis, but I think you can because, you know, my dad did that with me. Show me The Exorcist in elementary school, which you're not going to find in any parenting handbook or guide, I am sure. But you know what? I survived and I'm holding down a good job. I'm mostly living a healthy lifestyle. So I think my kid will be all right watching Chucky. I mean, Captain Howdy makes Chucky look like freaking Caillou. So it'll be all right. So when I watch this movie, that's what I'm saying. It makes me reflect on my coming into being a horror fan and it gets me stoked for the future and wanting to watch this with my kid and making them into a little Charles Lee Ray fanatic. This is a great movie with some unsung performances, and I think it's too much hate. Like Alex Vincent, I think he does great in this movie. I think he does some solid acting for a child actor. But you sickos online, you just love to give all the hate and all the venom to child actors. I mean, look what you did to that poor boy from The Phantom Menace, and look where he is now. So stop being so viral in hatred. These kids did way better in their performances and in their jobs than you might be doing in your 9 to 5. There, I said it. Let's be honest. I think Alex Vincent is very charming, very sweet, a nice little innocent boy that is fun to root for in this film. That opening sequence that we get with him to where he's just excited because it's his birthday and he's trying to make breakfast in bed for his mom. It's just heartwarming. It's nice. It's 80s goodness. It's sentimental. It's good stuff where you actually feel like you have fleshed out characters. You have this little family of two that just lean on one another and they are each other's worlds and it's precious. There you go. There, I said it. This is a horror channel. A lot of times we talk about guts and blood flying everywhere. We talk about mean, nasty stuff. No, this movie, it has some heart and it makes me love it all the more. It makes me root for these characters and it makes me want to make sure that nothing happens to them. It makes me want to surround them in bubble wrap and keep that evil ginger face fuck Chucky away from them. But speaking of Chucky, you gotta love Chucky, right? Look at the, the just this doll, that mean mug, that nasty little freckled face, fantastic design. And they really bring an iconic figure to life here in entry number one. If we only ever had one Child's Play movie, that would have probably been enough. We've already would have had the greatest movie in this little subgenre about creepy dolls and killer toys. This would be number one to me. And of course, so much of it has to do with Brad Dorff. What a wonderful performance by him as a vocal actor. You have that nasty, mean face on this doll already. You have him doing killing stuff. You have that background of him being a voodoo-loving serial killer. And then what he does with that cackling laugh and that sneering, snide voice that he just comes at you with, you're like, yeah, that, of course, is a voice this doll would have. And instead of feeling like ADR, you feel like that doll is just, just talking. And you just buy in and you can kind of suspend your disbelief a little bit and just go along for the ride and have a good old time with a solid ass horror movie that, like I said, would be my top 100 of all time. So give some love to Don Mancini. Give some love to Tom Holland. Not enough people do. You never hear about Tom Holland when people talk about their favorite horror directors. But he gave us Child's Play, which is in my top 100. He gave us the direct sequel to Psycho because the man's got balls all plenty. And he didn't just give us that sequel. He arguably made it better than the original. That is right. I have no problem coming out and being like, you know what? I have more fun watching the Psycho sequel than I do the original Psycho. I have an appreciation for that movie. It's a damn good movie. It is a classic. It is an important seminal film. But I think what Tom Holland did with the sequel is actually pretty heady, entertaining, riveting, scary, thrilling stuff. And nobody else could have really pulled that off. At least I don't think so. Then he also put out Fright Night. Who doesn't love Fright Night? So put some respect 
on the Tom Holland name, and we ain't talking about Spider-Man. Don Mancini, he's done some things to this franchise that I ain't about, that I don't love, if I'm being honest. I think things have gotten a little bit too weird. I think we've gone way off track, and I think you see a lot of that in the current TV series. But through his collaboration with Tom Holland and him being a little bit reined in, man, this was just we weren't just kind of like shotgunning ideas. This was a rifle. We aimed true. And I think we hit the target with this movie. And I think a lot of that has to do with this being a very personal story for him because Don Mancini's dad actually worked in marketing. So he kind of grew up seeing his dad market things to children. And that's a little bit insidious when you think about it. There's something just eh, vile about that. You look at American history. You look at stuff that goes down on Black Friday. You think about how people got maimed, assaulted, maybe even murdered over toys like the Cabbage Patch dolls. And it's like, oh, there's some subtext to this creepy doll movie. There's more beneath the surface than there might look. This is a lot more than just a regular old slasher. And I love it for that. You can't necessarily say that about some of the sequels, but this movie has that in spades. It's a smart little flick. Something else I love about this movie is that setting. I love that this is set in the winter. I can't explain it. It just does something to enhance it. It makes it feel more real. It's just, when it comes to December, I want to watch this movie. And I've often thought about doing like a top 10 list of best December or winter horror movies. And of course you would do things like Misery or The Thing or like The Lodge that came out a few years ago. But I don't think a lot of people think of Child's Play as like a winter horror movie. But when you watch it, you feel the coolness. And it kind of plays into, yes, this is about Andy's birthday, but it kind of feels like Christmas time. And so it feels like there's, you know, we're commenting on Christmas time. So that subtext gets bolstered and strengthened all the more and i think that that is sensational now as far as the plot i think it's just a very good strong story that feels mainlined it feels like all the fat has been cut off at least if you ask me and from the word go because the movie opens up with a fantastic hook to where we see a killer on the loose he's being pursued and he gets kind of rushed into this toy store. He gets fired upon. He is hit with a bullet and he starts bleeding out. He realizes he is going to die. And all of a sudden he starts doing like a voodoo incantation. Where have you seen something like this before? Nowhere. That is where. And now he's going to possess a doll. And we talked about that sweet little family earlier. So now you have this perverse kind of thing where you have that sweet little boy with a heart of gold. And he's being tucked in next to a doll that is imbued with the spirit of a serial killer and he's sitting there hugging the doll it should be a nice little moment but it's just corrupted and perverse and gross it makes you feel weird it gets under your skin it makes you fear for the child it makes you want to go shake them all and be like not everything is all right the kids are not all right have you checked the children that's what it makes you want to do so that's just really good stuff here that's kind of why this first movie works so much better than other films where you have older protagonists i really think the child's play was meant to be the story of a small child and their doll that is not just a doll. And of course, all the events therefore after are fantastic. It's fun to see him going around and killing people that he has beef with and grudges with, like Eddie Caputo, like Dr. Death. And my only real negative for the movie would be that because they were a bit hamstrung by, you know, money and other resources, that the kills, this, this movie might be, you know, the weakest when it comes to kills in the franchise. So you have what, Eddie Caputo, kind of dying off screen because you have the explosion. But hey, this is a good practical explosion. It looks nice. You have Meg being pushed out of the window, which really just comes like she throws herself out of the window. You don't get to see Chucky in the scene. You just know he kind of took the toy hammer and bumped her in the head. Uh, should have had a V8 and then she goes right out the window. And then, you know, the doctor, that's a good kill though. So maybe this isn't so weak now that I think about it. But, you know, the doctor straps the thing on, starts getting electrocuted. His eyes start kind of bleeding. He's kind of foamy. He's bleeding out the mouth. His face is kind of turning black and red. And it's, that's a good kill when I think about it. So I may need to walk back. Maybe I don't have really any issues with this first movie. All right. That's what I'm talking about. But even if those kills weren't for you and you thought they were a little bit weak sauce, you cannot deny the major reveal in this movie where the mother goes back home alone with the doll and soon she realizes that something is afoot, that Andy was not lying. It wasn't just his little boy imagination. He's not psychologically troubled. No, Chucky is in fact alive because the batteries were included, but they're not in the doll. And she realizes that she's trying to go to him to get him to talk and he won't do it. So she really pushes his buttons and she's about to throw them in the fireplace and you get that head snapping around and he just starts berating her and cursing her. You bitch, you fucking slut, you whore, all these things coming at her. 
That was on Bravo's list of top 100 scary moments of horror movies of all time. I loved that freaking ranking as a, a kid. I would watch that program all the time on Bravo. When I saw that, I was like, hell yeah, because I was already in the Chucky fandom. I was already a big fan of it. And as a kid, I saw that moment. I just lost my shit. I lost my marbles over it. And so when I saw it on that list, I was like, yeah. Glad to know I'm not alone. I think everybody loves that moment. That is where we first see, you know, that doll come to life. And we get our first bit of Brad Dorff delivering some mean ass one liners as Chucky and the rest is history. We have ourselves an icon, ladies and gentlemen. And that's really the turning point of the movie because they do this really interesting, fun thing early on where it's kind of like a who done it? You know, is Andy killing people? Is it the doll? What is going on here? Who do you believe? What is happening? The cop doesn't. You know, doesn't think that he can believe Andy and thinks there's something wrong with this kid. And they take Andy away from the mom. You know, again, we had this nice little family core and now things are going awry for them. So it gets you invested, you know, you're like, no, don't do that. This family don't tell them apart. Fuck you, Chucky. You fucking monster, man. And then you have this. And you're like, Oh, now we're just in slasher territory. Now we can get past all that stuff. That was fun for what it was. But now let's just get down to the meat and potatoes of this. And that is a creepy doll that goes around and kills people. And is trying to get out of his body because he has a date with a little boy. Yeah, that's a bit of a problematic line, but it's not like as bad as the first Halloween movie where Bob's talking about first I rip your clothes off, then you rip my clothes off, then we go rip Lindsay's clothes off. It's not quite that bad, but it's a little weird. I digress. Fantastic movie. Fantastic final act where they're in the apartment and they have to kill Chucky seemingly like 14 times because you have to shoot him directly in the heart and you just see this doll take more and more of a beating to where it's unrecognizable. At one point, it's just a charred mask coming towards you and his face is all goopy and it's hideous and it's terrifying and it's awesome. It is awesome. I love the practical effects here in the ending. Yes, there is a bit where you can, of course, tell that that is a little person and the little person is actually bigger than the doll has been the entire movie. Yes, you could point that out. But you know what? It's not a CGI doll. It's not some horribly rendered mess like the end of The Boy 2. And it doesn't ruin anything for me. So I'm here for it. I love that final bit. And I just think it's funny that Tom Holland tried to put as much of an ass-kicking abuse that he could on this doll. Because he wanted it to be a one-off. He didn't want it to be watered down by copious amounts of sequels. So he's like, you know what? I'm going to disfigure this thing and maim it and destroy it. And leave it into a little piece of nothing so they can't come back and just make this some sort of try hard cash cow that loses its appeal over time you tried you tried tom holland and for that we applaud you but you know what money talks bullshit walks and so chucky's just gonna keep on going for forever at this point we have a tv series now and i will be reviewing that episode by episode in october so if you enjoyed this review you enjoyed hearing me talk about chucky and made you relive some of your favorite moments of the movie and get you psyched to go check the movie out again or to watch this series then maybe hit subscribe and come along for the rest of the ride but other than that i got one thing to ask you have yourself a great day i'm nate for nate Merflix, and that's a wrap